whenever I'm studying a passage of the Bible, whether it's for a sermon or, or just my own study, maybe the main thing I want to try to figure out is what was the original author saying to the original audience and how would they have understood that? It's a really important thing to, tr to figure out. Uh, the, the Bible is not about us, right? It's, it was preserved for us. But there's a danger in trying to insert ourselves into every passage. We'll misunderstand. This book of Philippians that we've been studying through, it was a letter from a real guy who called himself Paul to a group of real people. Uh, one of the commentaries that I'm reading as, as I study for, for this series, a guy named Dr. Gordon Fee, he wrote this. He said, a passage like the one we're going to study today, a passage like this ought to serve as a constant reminder to all of us that the New Testament was written in the context of real people in a very real world. Biblical texts are too often the scholar's playground and the believer's rule book without adequate appreciation for the truly human nature of these texts. Today, what we're going to read, this is not one of the more famous passages in the New Testament or in Philippians. Philippians has a lot of really famous verses. You won't find any of them in today's passage. This is uh, where Paul writes to his friends, the Philippians, about two of their common friends. Have you ever had a conversation with one friend about another friend that was good? <laughs> Where you appreciated what was good about your common friend? That's what we're going to read today at the most basic level. There's, it's about travel plans. Paul hopes to send one or both of these guys from Rome where he's imprisoned to Philippi. But it's one of those passages you can read through and kind of ask, want to ask yourself, what is this even doing here? What's this for? What am I supposed to learn? Well, here's what we have to do. First, we have to just look, look at, figure out what Paul was writing to his friends, the Philippians, and why in the given context that this appears. And then maybe we can learn some things for our lives. So that's what we're going to do today. First, the context that this passage finds itself in. Everything we have read since chapter 1, verse 27 has been about this. Paul wrote only or exclusively, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What's that mean? Well, everything we've talked about since we read that verse, that's what it means. Conduct yourself, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. So Paul told us that looks like standing together with other Christians, defending the faith, protecting one another. That looks like uh, putting your salvation to work in your life, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's part of this. Primarily, the bulk of what Paul has said since then is about humility. Conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ is having an accurate assessment of who you are, which means I see my sin clearly, but I also see that I'm an adopted child of God and he's got stuff for me, that waiting for me and stuff for me to do now. And, and humility is also putting others in front of yourself. Putting the interests of others ahead of your own interests. That's what we've been talking about since 127. Paul has held up two examples thus far of, of people who conducted themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The first one was Jesus. Maybe you've heard of him. Paul wrote a, a hymn or a poem. He inserted that in the text. It was all about Jesus' humility. And Paul has also used himself, Paul, as an example of someone who conducts himself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, if I told you that to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, you have to be just like Jesus or just like Paul, what might the reaction be to that? 
But you feel like kind of throwing your hands up and be like, well, I mean, come on, what's the point? I'm not going to, that's a bar I can't reach. Jesus was God and was perfect. And even Paul is like a Christian superhero almost, it seems like. Um, it doesn't seem like that's a very attainable goal. So here's what Paul's going to do today. He's going to hold up two other examples. A guy named Timothy, a guy named Epaphroditus. Paul knows them. The Philippian knows them. The Philippians know these two men. And they're going to be God, Paul's example of two men who conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Examples are important. So that's what we're going to read today. Examples help us realize and really kind of sink our teeth into what is actually possible. So let's read our passage today. It's really about uh, uh, traveling plans for two guys. This, this, is, uh, uh, this would probably be Timothy, and this is Epaphroditus. Timothy apparently prayed a lot, that was what I'm gathering here. And then Epaphroditus is like, man, get a load of this guy. He prays all the time. Look at him. Uh, actually, I dislike all the, every other picture you see up here. I ripped them off the internet. So that's what we're reading. Philippians 2, 19 through 30. It's the New American Standard translation. And it reads this way. Paul says, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit besides Timothy, who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For most others all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of Timothy's proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. And therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. Verse 25, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. I sent him because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on Epaphroditus, and not, not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Verse 28, and therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. There's our passage. It can be uh, divided really obviously and easily into two parts, the Timothy part and the Epaphroditus part. So we'll start with the Timothy part. And we see right away in this that, that Paul, he hopes to send Timothy from Rome, where Paul is imprisoned and Timothy's with him, Paul hopes to send Timothy to Philippi. He would like to send Timothy to Philippi, but it's not a real confident hope. He doesn't know if that's going to be possible. There's something keeping that from being possible. Paul says, but that's what he wants. Paul says, I hope, but I hope in the Lord Jesus. This is like the fine print. Uh, for Paul, Paul made Paul's plans, but Paul knew my plans are always subject to the Lord's plans. So he wanted to send Timothy. He also realizes God may not want me to, for that to be possible right now. Um, why would Paul want to send Timothy? There's lots of Christians in Rome. He could send anybody. That's most of what the rest of the Timothy section is about why Paul wants to send Timothy from Rome to Philippi. What's the highest compliment you think you could give another person? Think about that for a second. Or what, what do you think would be the highest compliment someone could give you? 
Maybe for you, it would be telling someone that they're a really hard worker or pointing out their massive talent or ability. Maybe the nicest thing we could say about someone else or have said about us is something Paul says about Timothy in verse 20. He gives him some really high praise in this commendation in this letter. He wants to send Timothy. Why, Paul says, for I have no one so like-minded with me. Literally, that says like-souled. Timothy's soul is like mine, Paul says. And that's not the good part. Here's why that is true. Someone who will so sincerely care for your state. Maybe that's the highest praise we could ever give someone else. If someone would say of you, that is, that is a man, that is a woman who sincerely, who genuinely cares for other people. And the key word there is sincerely. Like not that I am someone who does things for other people, but maybe hoping that you guys catching this, you see what I'm doing here? Not so someone else sees. Paul says of Timothy, it's like he cares about you guys and it comes from a very real place in his heart. It's genuine. It's sincere. I'm not sure there's anything better you could say about another person. And Paul lets us know next how rare that is. Verse 21, he says, other folks, even among Christians, others are busy with their own concerns and not the concerns of Jesus Christ. Okay, first about 21, I want to say this. Ouch, Paul, like words hurt. Because how many of you read that? Like other people are just, they have their own stuff going on and they're too busy with their own stuff instead of the concerns of Christ. How many of you just want to go, holy smokes, did you have to put that in there? Boy, this is rare though. It is a rare thing to find and to know another person who sincerely cares for others and has the concerns of Jesus Christ at the forefront of their life, of his or her life. That's what Paul says about his young friend, Timothy. In verse 22, Paul lets us know something that I find interesting. He reminds us that the Philippians already know Timothy. So he says that wonderful stuff about Timothy, and he says, but then he says, but you guys already know this. If you were here when we introduced this book, uh, we learned that the Philippians know Timothy already. That's why he showed up in the first verse of this book. Paul said, hey, Timothy's here while I'm writing. Because they know Timothy in the book of Acts. When Paul uh, takes the gospel onto the shores of Europe and his first stop is Philippi, Timothy is with him. They know how good of a guy Timothy is. You know his qualifications. You know how closely he worked with me. You know how he worked to advance the gospel. I don't need to tell you guys about Timothy. You already know Timothy, which brings up a question. So why tell him how good of a guy Timothy is if they already know, given that A, like they already know him, and B, it seems like Paul knows he can't send Timothy there. He says, I'd really like to send Timothy. It's the next best thing to sending myself. He's just like me. But it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to send him. So let me tell you how awesome of a guy he is, even though I can't send him, and you already know. Why would Paul do, why would he waste the ink on that? Because remember what this is about. Live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. And so here Paul holds up Timothy. Right? It's not just Jesus. It's not just Christian superhero Paul. You guys know Timothy. He does this. He's sincerely concerned about others and he has the interests of the Lord first. There's an example that you guys know and love. Paul ends the Timothy section this way. So I, I hope to send him soon. 
but I have to wait until I figure out how my little situation turns out. What's Paul's situation? He's in, he's in the clink. He's imprisoned. He's under house arrest. And for, until that's resolved, for whatever reason, it seems like Timothy can't leave. Paul says, I want to leave, and I hope I'll be able to come soon too. And I hope Timothy can go, but right now, we can't. I don't know what it is about Timothy's situation that, uh, that makes him unable to leave. I don't know if he has to testify. I don't know if he is under arrest also. I don't know if he's just so important to Paul. But he can't go. The, again, this is a real letter. I think the author and the recipients know what that means, and we, we just don't. That's the Timothy section. The Epaphroditus section starts uh, next in verse 25. And Epaphroditus has, has a different situation than, than does Timothy and Paul. Paul would like to go to Philippi. He can't right now. Paul would like to send Timothy to Philippi. He can't right now. Paul's going to send Epaphroditus. He can go, and he will. Now, a little background on Epaphroditus. If you take everything we read here, a couple other places that he's mentioned, here's what we know about Epaphroditus. First, he is a Philippian. He's from Philippi. He's a leading member of that church. Uh, you know, you can tell he's from uh, from Greece because his name is Epaphroditus, which is the Greekiest Greek name that's ever been written, um, if you know Greek. So he's from there. He's one of them. We know that uh, when, when the Philippians learned that Paul was imprisoned in Rome, when word traveled from Rome to Philippi, which happened a lot, uh, Philippi is a colony of Rome. It's Rome away from Rome. There's a big military base there, a lot of travel back and forth between Rome and Philippi. So when they learn, the Philippian church learns that Paul's in prison in Rome, they take up a collection, a financial gift, because in the Roman world, if you found yourself in a Roman prison, you had to pay for your room and board, so to speak. So they pay, pick, take up a collection, and Epaphroditus is the guy who carries that sizable financial gift to Paul in Rome, and he's supposed to stay there and, and minister to Paul. Epaphroditus makes himself, now he doesn't just contribute to that offering, he makes himself part of the offering, and he's going to go and live there near Paul and help take care of Paul. That's what Paul means by saying he is your messenger and minister to me in my need, because he came from Philippi. Paul's got really high praise for Epaphroditus also. He calls him my brother, my co-worker, and my fellow soldier. How cool would it be to carry a letter? Epaphroditus is surely the, the person who carried this letter back to Philippi. How cool would it be to carry around a letter where the Apostle Paul called you his brother, his co-worker, and his fellow soldier? That's high praise. Brother, it is the, the normal name for a fellow Christian in the New Testament, but from the Apostle Paul, to call him his brother, there's a sense of special equality there. Like Paul's an apostle, Epaphroditus is not, but Paul says we are brothers. And then Paul says he's a co-worker and fellow soldier. Do you know all churches need people who are co-workers and fellow soldiers. Here's what I think Paul means by those two roles. Epaphroditus was a co-worker in the gospel with Paul. He was a builder of this thing we call the church. Jesus promised to build his church, but he does that work through co-workers. So he was a gospel worker. And then... He was also a fellow soldier. He was a soldier who, had, who defended what is built. Like in the ancient world, you know, the soldiers might defend a, a, their city. Um, what is the church made up of? Is the church a building, yes or no? No, the church is made up of people. 
right? We are the church. So a soldier who defends the church does defend the faith and upholds the truth, but defends and, def- and, and protects the people that make it up. Every church needs co-workers and soldiers. And Epaphroditus was both of those things. In verse 26 and, and 27 and then verse 30 also, Paul mentions this illness that Epaphroditus had. Um, he was sick, sick, Epaphroditus was. And this illness that he's now recovered from apparently is part of the reason apparently that Paul wants to send him back to Philippi. Paul says, he he greatly missed all of you. I want to send him back because he missed all of you and he was distressed because you heard he was ill. In fact, he was so ill he nearly died. He says that again in verse 30. But I want you to notice something about Epaphroditus in this illness. According to Paul, What stressed Epaphroditus out about his illness? Was he distressed because he might die? No. He was distressed because of what his illness might do to his church, his friends back in Philippi. Do you hear the others focus there? This guy was sick. Paul seems like, I thought he was going to die. And he was stressed that the effect of his illness might have on other people. Again, this is an example of gospel humility that Paul is holding up. He he missed everyone and he didn't want them to be sort of put out by his illness. Verse 27, uh, Paul writes, In fact, he became so ill he nearly died, but God showed mercy to Epaphroditus, not only to him, but also to me, so that I would not have grief on top of grief. Does being a Christian mean? If If you're a Christian, you believe that when Jesus went to the cross, what he was doing was suffering the punishment from God that you deserve for your sins. He suffered instead of you, in your place. You're a Christian, and then if you live the Christian life good enough, does that mean you will not have grief, pain, sorrow? Does Christianity insulate us from those things? The answer is no. Here's one way we we know. Look what Paul calls his imprisonment, his situation. Grief. Paul has joy that the world can't take away. But he doesn't enjoy being in a Roman prison. Those aren't the same thing. And Paul says, God was merciful to me, or to Epaphroditus by healing him, but to me also because I did not want to... This would be a tough letter to write. I did not want to write to you back in Philippi and say, hey, thanks for the offering. Thanks for sending Epaphroditus. I'm sorry the trip killed him, right? That's a difficult letter to have to write. And Paul said, I'm so relieved that God spared him. I want to take a bit of a rabbit trail real fast here to point something out. Was Paul still healing people miraculously by this point in his his ministry? Because if we would turn to the book of Acts, we won't for time's sake. If we would examine the early uh, months and years of Paul's ministry, Paul was gifted with the ability to heal folks. Like miraculously, powerfully heal folks. And he did that, similarly to how Jesus did that. My belief in the position, the official position of, of this church is that by the time the New Testament closed, those gifts had closed, had ceased. Um, And here's one good piece of evidence for that, I believe. If, If Paul was still healing people, and his good buddy, his brother, his fellow worker, his fellow soldier, Epaphroditus was sick, 
Why didn't Paul just heal him? It's at least a good question. He, Paul doesn't seem like he was confident Epaphroditus was going to be healed. He just seems relieved that he was healed. Now, God still heals people miraculously. Not always. It's not normative. It's what makes them miracles. God can do whatever God wants, whenever God wants. But the gift to be able to heal when I want, that's what we believe has ceased. And I just want to point out that this is, a, I think, a pretty strong evidence that by the end, this is later in Paul's career, I think some of those gifts had receded even from Paul by this time. So good news, Epaphroditus didn't die. And we see Paul's others focus um, on display next. In verse 28, where Paul says, Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him. Now, why does Paul want to send Epaphroditus back to Greece or Macedonia, back to Philippi? Is it because he doesn't need a good worker around anymore? Like, who couldn't use a good worker. Is it because Paul doesn't like being around him anymore? No. Paul says, I want to send him back there because I want you to rejoice. And this translation says, so I can be free of concern or anxiety. Here's what Paul says. I know because he got so sick and he's so important to you guys back there. I know that when you see him, your anxiety level is going to drop. And that's going to make mine do the same thing. Because again, Paul has this sincere heart that cares for the well-being of others. And Paul's like, so I don't, I don't care so much what Epaphroditus can do for me if I can sort of use him to do something good for you. That's Paul's other's focus, his humility on display. And then Paul concludes this section in verses 29 and 30 when he writes, this. So, when Epaphroditus gets there, he's probably carrying this letter, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. There are some scholars who think that the folks back in Philippi will be sore at Epaphroditus for showing back up. Because Epaphroditus, we sent you there to take care of Paul. What are you doing back here? And so Paul wants to make sure. He tells him, no, I sent him back. Okay, don't hold this against him. So welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like Epaphroditus. I mean, he almost died to serve Christ. He risked his life so that he could make up for your inability or your lack. Here's what Paul means at the end right there. Not everyone can just leave Philippi and travel to Rome to serve Paul. Epaphroditus could do what they couldn't do. But I want to point out that there's an interesting command here. It got me a little bit studying this. Do you see the command, Paul says, for them specifically welcome him. We can't do that one anymore. But look at what Paul says, and this is in the imperative. It's a command. Honor people like Epaphroditus. Your translation might word that a little bit differently. But the idea is, is there. Make a big deal out of, honor people, hold in very high regard people like Epaphroditus, who are soldiers and fellow workers, who are others focused. Paul said a similar thing to the Thessalonian church. Or he wrote, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who labor among you and preside over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Esteem them most highly in love because of their work. Those are interesting commands, aren't they? Why would Paul command two different churches, find people who do this well and honor them? Isn't that, that's kind of, I, thought, I thought that was strange. Here's why. Examples are important. 
Examples are important. They help us know what's like really possible. You know why impoverished areas of our country, really the world, but we'll just use our country, tend to stay impoverished one reason? Do you know why young people that grow up and stay in impoverished areas are overwhelmingly likely to stay impoverished? Part of the reason is there are no examples that make anything else possible, like really tangibly possible. I went to basketball. I went to basketball. I went to college and played basketball with a couple of of brothers who were the two youngest kids of 12, and they grew up in the projects of Elizabeth, New Jersey. And I was reminded of them thinking about this, because they told me everyone in their projects was just going to grow up and live in the projects. Like they got out to Kansas And they never left. They never went home. Because they got around like other possibilities. In the projects, they said there was like a couple of pro athletes from like 10 and 25 years ago that kind of got successful. There's like a couple of rappers and there's a bunch of drug dealers. That's who everybody else just figures out how to like survive. And that's just what everyone does there. We got out here, and, and there are people who, like, they were good friends with somebody who owned some pizza huts. Like, that became a real thing, being a business owner. Uh, there, were, there were teachers, there were professors, there were doctors and lawyers, people they, they knew, and it let them sink their teeth into this reality, like, oh, like, I, people really do this stuff. It's not like just on TV. It made it feel possible. You know, the church isn't all that different in some way. Like, I wanted to be, originally, a teacher and a coach because I had teachers and coaches that had impacted my life in a positive way. Let me know I could do that. So here's what Paul says. When Epaphroditus gets back there, you've got an example of someone who, who has almost died for this thing. He lives in a manner worthy of the gospel Make an example out of that. And Paul has to command the church to do this because we don't like doing this for several reasons. People who really do stuff for the benefit of others don't want this. They didn't do it for for that. And also, as soon as you start honoring one person, guess what other people in the crowd are starting to do? Either thinking, well, how about me? me, I I did 10 or 12 things. It should be me. Or let me tell you about the three dishonorable things that gal did. Why are you making an example of her? I can tell you why you should never want to. And it can, be, can cause problems. But Paul says we need this because, it, because living in a manner worthy of the gospel is hard. It can feel impossible. So Paul says, find someone who does. Make that the example. Be an example like that. That's what... Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel is be that example that someone else can see that this is possible. And then when someone else does it, maybe we ought to tell them. I feel like you genuinely care for the interests of other people. Like, it's okay. Like, I recognize that in you. I want to be like that. Because examples are important. So, Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Someone else needs to see that it's possible. And they might see that in you. And second, when you see that in someone else, like tell them, celebrate that. Make that the example, right? Instead of that feeling where I can't tell that person how great they're doing because really just makes me feel bad about how I'm doing. Ah, that's our pride. And this is about humility. Find the example Celebrate the example. Be the example. We need it. We need it. Let's pray. Father, our God, thank you for preserving uh, even the unusual parts of your word for us. In this just letter amongst friends where we see examples um, of men who walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, who have genuine concern for the well-being of other people. 
And, and thank you even for the, the encouragement to recognize that when we see it, to make that the example that it might be tangible and realistic in our lives to do this Christianity thing. Help us become that example, not because we want other people looking at us and recognizing us and honoring us, just because this is what this is, part of what this is about. And then give us the, help us know who we need to, to honor and encourage that we see what they've been doing. Help us point out the good examples you've given. God, thank you for this, for your word, and for your love for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and we will finish.